Shalom, brothers and sisters all over the world. I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion. And as always, of course, a very warm welcome to you, Baruch. How are you? Thank God, Christian. I'm doing well. And yourself and your family? We're doing well. Praise God. Praise God. Um, welcome, brothers and sisters, to yet again another one of our discussions. Um, the title, as you've seen, is Eight Reasons Why Yeshua, or Jesus, Will Be Soon Returning. Now, we need to be upfront, as always. Um, we are kind of like limited in the contents of time with these videos. We could have put a lot more than eight reasons. However, we want to try and focus on about eight particular things and why we believe that Messiah's return is coming very soon. However, before I uh, begin, and you'll see it on the first slide, I think you and I are, are agree very much about this, Baruch, that we never, ever set dates. Um, many you know, ministries do that to sell books or things of that nature, or we don't do that. Uh, but what are your opening comments, Baruch? Uh, uh, very incorrect to set dates. The Bible says no one knows the, the day or the hour. And therefore, it is unscriptural to set a date, but we're called to be ready. We're called to watch. And this is a very important term. In fact, Messiah uses three different words in speaking to, to the church in telling us to watch. And therefore, if we're called to watch, there must be something to watch. There must be signs. And this really is at the heart of this video. Exactly right. So if you're ready, Baruch, I'm going to start sharing my screen and let's begin. Okay, so as we said there just a moment ago, we never said dates. You will see uh, both in black and in red for our uh, Spanish speaking viewers. So let's kick it off, Baruch. Now, here we've got the eight reasons why, which we'll go into in detail. Uh, the first here on the left, we're going to look at that there's an increase of knowledge deception, an apostasy, a convergence, which is definitely taking place, the one world satanic government being established, a prelude to the mark of the beast, the gospel needs to be preached in all the world, and a very special focus is, of course, on Israel. So we're going to start looking at each one of these from a biblical perspective. So let's go into Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Over to you, Brooke. Well, one thing, just not knowledge, but that phrase, and many shall run to and fro. We see today how people are moving all about the world. This, this uh, transition, the ability to travel so, so freely, or at least before the, the COVID situation, we're returning to that now. But as you pointed out, knowledge shall increase. And I don't know the statistics, but I've heard just ridiculous things, which, are, or which I'm sure are accurate. It's just mind-boggling how much information just every day is added and is growing. And therefore, that is a clear sign of the last days. And what that should tell us is this, that the book of Daniel has now an ability to perceive it, to understand it, and ought to be studied. When it says, shut up these words and seal this book, notice it says, until the time of the end. And with this increasing of knowledge, this is a, a hint to us, an admonition. Let's study the book of Daniel. There's much there in order to help us to be ready for Messiah's return. Amen. Thank you. Now, this is very important in Matthew 24, verses 3 to 5. Now, he sat, meaning Yeshua, on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, say I am the Christ, and will deceive many. I think it's important before I hand over to you, Brooke, that the first thing that Yeshua mentioned about the end days and the sign would be uh, deception that would be on such an increase. And I like to look at it this way, that if he, it's the first thing that he mentioned, we need to certainly sit up and take notice. So over to you, Brooke. 
Uh, I agree. Deception is a, a key indicator of the last days and the closeness of Messiah's return. And one of the questions that we should ask ourselves is, where does this deception come from? And the quick and the knee-jerk reaction is, well, it comes from the enemy. That's true. But notice what Messiah says at the end of this passage. It says, for many will come in my name. So these are people who are believers, supposedly. At least they come in his name, and they proclaim that, that I, meaning Yeshua, is the Messiah. So this verse tells us that many are going to come and say, I agree, Yeshua, Jesus, he is the Messiah. They're going to say this. They're going to profess that they're believers, but they are going to be sources of deceit, meaning, at least to a certain degree, this deceit is going to come out of the church. And that's why it's so important to to know, to know this book to be studying to show yourself approved, because in various places that, that have a cross that, that holds this book, that, that, that meet in order to worship Messiah, these can be places that become strongholds of the enemy, and we need that spiritual discernment. So it's very important that we do studies and, and, and videos like this to give people some some foundations for knowing what to expect and where the warnings come from. And you're spot on, Baruch. I mean, we've had uh, numerous videos that we've done exposing false teachers and wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, I mean, we're basically doing what Ephesians 5, 11 tells us, you know, have no part with darkness or weakness, but rather expose them. But I'm still stunned, Baruch, that even though 95% of the emails and comments that we get are all positive, and we praise God for that. I am still stunned when sometimes I still get people defending uh, ministries like Stephen Ferdix, Hillsong, Bethel, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, and the list just goes on and on. And it really makes me sad that people do not see clearly the deception that's involved in those. And then it comes from within, like you said. So before I move on, any other comment on that? Subject for nope. I just, just want to echo and agree with you on what you said. Okay. Now, here's about that convergence that we're talking about in Matthew 24, 6, 8, when Messiah says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. These are the beginning of sorrows. Before I hand over to you, Baruch, I mean, we've seen what's happening with um, the Ukraine, of course, and other nations in NATO now getting involved. Um, But it's not just limited to there. You know, there are so many conflicts uh, taking place all over the world, and some are raising their ugly heads again that, and it's also tied to, you know, we look at famines, you know, they're looking at the supply shortages. There are already countries saying that they're, they're going into famines now. So this is all converging together. But Messiah was very clear and said that, you know, see that you're not troubled for these things must come to pass for the end is not yet. But over to you, bro, for your comments. Yeah, uh, as you know, I, I've been traveling a little bit. Thankfully, back in Israel, and I was, I was traveling, I was watching something late at night, and I, I don't remember the individual or who he was, I've never seen him before, but, but he was reporting, and of course, he talked about Ukraine, he talked about conflicts in Africa, he talked about uh, tension in India, between India and Pakistan, India and China, and China and Taiwan, and in other places. And we know the war is still going on in in Syria as well. There's much conflict there with Iran. So these rumors of wars are very, very strong. And and likewise, we see that, that earthquakes are increasing. Things can happen very quickly. And it doesn't take a lot to just put this world in utter turmoil. There's so much instability and, and fragileness in, in politics, in the economy, uh, in social uh, conflicts, 
uh, with thank God for the recent uh, uh, Supreme Court in the United States, the Supreme Court decision uh, uh, upholding uh, the sanctity of life yes. and, and against the, the wicked Roe versus Wade. But that has also really brought out the hostility and making some clear division, lines of division. And therefore, I hope people are seeing that things can, can, can change very quickly. There's much source of instability and conflict. And as we know, uh, a match sometimes can ignite something. And likewise, something can happen and bring about all these things. Uh, and I like the word. In fact, we talked about this maybe two years ago, and you shared it with me, this term convergence. And I really like that it resonated with me because this is exactly what we see, a conversion of what Messiah said. One more point. Now, you're using, I think, is this the new King James? Yes, correct. Now, the reason why I know it's either the King James or the new King James is because it says towards the end where it has the word pestilence. If you're using some of the more modern translations, which are based upon a different Greek text, the word pestilence is not there. I recently had a big uh, discussion with someone, but when we look at Luke in both Greek texts, whether we're dealing with the Texas Receptus or Nestle Allen, the critical text, in Luke, when this is quoted, pestilence is there. So the best manuscripts have that term pestilence, and, and I don't believe we've seen anything related to what God means in his word when he says that there are going to be pestilence. There's going to be really serious diseases that don't have a, a, a healing rate of 99 point something percent, but it's going to have a, a death rate of a much, much more significant amount of people. Get ready. These things are happening. He spoke these things to the disciples, and he said, the end is not yet. And realize, I think that was in the previous one, he uses two different words. When he says, and the disciples ask the question, what's the end of the age? That is a, a different construction than when Yeshua spoke about the end is not yet, or then the end will be. That word that he used is somewhat different than the one that the disciples use. So there's a difference between the end of the church age, which is what Messiah is referring to, and the end of the age, which the disciples alluded to. I mean, and Baruch, I want to touch on something that you've just raised that you're so right. I am also <clears throat> rejoicing about the uh, Roe versus Wade decision that, um, you know, the, the unborn babies are now given hope of life. Um, but you're right, it, it set, uh, it ignited a fire that you see people that are pro-abortion just protesting now with such hatred. And you really see that antichrist spirit in them, that spirit of murder that's in them that, because no matter what you say, no matter what anyone that can camouflage it anyone they want, it is murder, abortion is murder. And it, it's just really dividing countries, even here in Australia, there have been people, you know, out protesting against that decision and it's it's really a sign of the times what we're seeing such such division and turmoil but i digress um second Thessalonians 2 verse 3 let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition uh, before I pound over to you, Baruch, obviously the falling away is that apostasia, apostasy. Um, I think there's two things that we can probably discuss here, Baruch. We look at, and I'm also always mindful of what people start writing in the comments or asking questions. Their main arguments are two arguments of this, that they say that day, it's not talking about the rapture, the harpazo our blessed hope. It's actually talking about the second coming because they believe, I'm not saying I agree with them, they believe that we, the church, will not see the Antichrist. I know your view is that we will see the Antichrist before the rapture of the church, but I think this is important when we look at the falling away, that it is the apostasy. But what are your comments, Baruch, that in response to those people that say, no, this has got nothing to do with the rapture because we won't see the Antichrist, um, that they claim that this is actually the second coming of Christ. 
Yeah, very important issue. I, I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to, to address this. And this is verse three that you have there. I would just encourage people to look at verse one, where he's speaking to believers. He uses the term brethren, which means brothers and sisters. And he's speaking about our gathering together. It says the coming, and it's the word parousia. So it's the coming uh, of the Lord. But it says our gathering together unto, unto him. Now, we all are familiar with the term synagogue. It's a Greek word. That word appears there, but there's a prefix to it. Synagogue simply means to, it's a word ago, which means to, to lead or to come. And the word soon, which is with. So it's to, to come with or come together. But what's interesting, it has the word epi as an additional prefix, which means to come together with or unto. And so what's significant here is the term means us being gathered together unto him. Now, this is not the second coming. Why? Well, in the second coming, we are coming with Messiah. He's not gathering us because from the rapture, the scripture says, encourage one another. Because once the rapture happens, we are always going to be with him. So the rapture is when we are gathered to him. So when we look at the indicators of, of verse one, it's clearly speaking about the rapture. And that's why in, in verse two, it, when it says in the verse that you have, verse three, that day, if we go back up, it's the day of Christ. Now, I realize many translations have the day of the Lord, but that's in the critical text, which puts up alternative writings, meaning things that are not probably in the best, best manuscripts, but the differences, the major differences. But we have here, and by the way, a lot of people, I ask them, how many times is the day of the Lord mentioned in, in, the, in the New Testament? In the Old Testament, it's mentioned frequently. But by that term, day of the Lord, well, the only place it appears is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and in verse 2, if you translate it incorrectly, the day of the Lord. But the term, the day of Christ, or the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, or, or the day of, of the Lord Jesus, these three terms, it appears six different times. So in the New Testament, what's emphasized, because he's speaking to believers, is the day of Messiah, which is a term for the rapture. So the day of the Lord doesn't concern believers. So why would Paul be talking to believers about the day of the Lord. The context is the Thessalonians are concerned that they've missed something. They're confused because they're being persecuted yes. and they're suffering. Therefore, they're saying, what is this? Why are we going through this, this persecution in the plurals and tribulation in the plural? Why are we going through this? Did we miss out on the blessed hope? And then Paul in chapter two is saying, no, you didn't miss out because as you pointed out in verse three, let's not be deceived for that day. And we're talking about the day of Christ. That's the context will not come unless first there's the falling away, the apostasy and the man of sin would be revealed. I assure you, this is not just what I believe. I know it based upon scripture that before the rapture happens, the antichrist will be functioning. And I, I would love to be wrong. But when I look at the scripture, there's no way that that is a proper belief that will be removed before the Antichrist begins his activity. Wish it was, but it's not the reality. And before uh, pre-tribulation people start posting comments, I know that they always say, yes, but uh, we, we will not see God's wrath. He did not promise us. Uh, we agree with that. Um, that's also very clear in scripture. We know 100% that we as the body of Christ will not go through God's wrath. However, we just always encourage people just to be prayerfully about this, go prayerfully about it, look at these scriptures in detail. And then, you know, we can always have um, respectful discussions about that subject. But let's move on. <clears throat> Revelation 13, 1 and 2. Then I stood in the sand of the sea and I saw the beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, 10 crowns, and on his head, 
a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Also refer people back to Daniel 7, verses 16 to 24. This is specifically talking about the one world antichrist government, which <clears throat> is starting to take shape. Before I hand over to you, Baruch, we see the World Economic Forum gathering regularly with a lot of elite leaders and government leaders. Uh, we're seeing what NATO is doing on the eve of the new Ukraine war. We really beginning to see that this one world antichrist government is being set up, getting ready for the appearance of the antichrist. But over to your comments, bro. Yeah, I, I concur with you 100%. This is exactly what this scripture is saying. It is a, a sign that we should be taking, taking notice of, and that is how governments are, are doing the same thing. It's almost as though there is some leader that is really influencing governments to make the same decisions on things, that there's a, a commonality. And I would say that, that the governments today are moving not closer to God, but rapidly away from him. We see hostility towards the things of God, especially when it relates to Yeshua and, and faith in him and his message. More and more, we're being told that if we embrace the Bible and what the Bible literally says, that we're bigots, that we, we are hateful people, that we are speaking hate, hateful speech and such, and we are being marginalized. And this lays the foundation for persecution. So this scripture is, is, is excellent. It does indeed say that one of the signs is this, this coming, this establishment of a one world government that ultimately, maybe not initially, but ultimately the Antichrist is going to rule over that one world government. Be ready. It's on the horizon. Amen. Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom that he who understand, has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for he is the number of a man. His number is 666. We've done a, quite a few videos together, Baruch, talking about the mark of the beast. Uh, we've shared from our biblical perspective, our biblical views that um, the jab is not the mark of the beast and other things are not, but it's certainly, um, whether it be the technology, the government agendas, or um, how they use to control this whole scenario that they are certainly setting up the stage, like we just discussed before, in line with this one world government, for this mark of the beast as well, and that ultimately people won't be able to buy or sell without it. You and I have discussed this in detail and we agree, Baruch, but no one can be tricked into it. It's something that you will willingly know, that you will willingly uh, take this mark as an allegiance to the Antichrist. You can't be tricked into it. But I think we're seeing already the stage being set with everything that I've just mentioned. But what are your comments, Baruch? Yeah, I again, uh, I want to echo those things. I agree with that uh, in all sincerity. Uh, when it says, here is wisdom, we think that that's speaking to the lost, to those who don't know God, who have rejected God. No, that's speaking to those who have wisdom. And we're talking about a godly wisdom that is rooted in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I believe with, with clarity, when we look at this scripture, it is speaking about an encouragement for those to stand against that. And it's not speaking to non-believers. See, one of the things that I would, would say to people, and, and this is not going off on a tangent, it's, it's at the heart of this. I don't see in the scripture where there's this great evangelism after the rapture. Now, I see that one-third of Israel coming, but not through evangelism. They're going to look upon the one who is pierced. They're going to be looking for Messiah, and they're going to see and experience his deliverance, and that's going to bring them to faith. Not some great evangelical movement that's going to happen after the rapture. Uh, this 
concept of the great tribulation, most people don't know where to place that great tribulation and who it's in light of who's going through that great tribulation. They assume that this has to do with the wrath of God. I would argue that it's the, the wrath and the persecution from the Antichrist to, to believers if we look carefully at what uh, Revelation chapter 7 says. We don't see anywhere in the scripture that it speaks about 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Show me that scripture. Now, I see that there's 144,000 and they're from the, the tribes of Israel. But where do we see that they're evangelists? Where's that scripture? Now, I know the rationale, which is very faulty in, in trying to put two pieces of scripture together and saying a cause and effect, know what people say, but that is not what the scripture says. There's going to be an angel. Look at Revelation 14, verse 6. The angel's the one that has the everlasting gospel that's going to go throughout the world not some 144,000 Jewish evangelists. So anyway, we need to not simply repeat what we hear, but yes. do thorough Bible study and, and be accurate and be able to support what we believe with scripture. And, and here, this is clearly, now you're, you're mentioning Revelation 13. What I would say is this, if you would go back up, I'm speaking to each individual and look at the same chapter in, in verses uh, seven and eight, if we look there, it's talking about this Antichrist making war with who? Saints. The saints. And to show that this is speaking of the church, it says, I believe in verse nine, it says, to him who have ears. Lady. Now, this is what he says to the seven churches in Asia Minor. That phrase, he who has ears, is a reference to the church. So we need to look at the clues of the text. So we arrive at truth and not simply report what we hear other people say and their faulty methodology of looking at scripture. We need to let the scripture speak to us and answer the question, why does this, this antichrist empire make war with the saints? What saints are we referring to? Very important that we, we answer those questions before we formulate our eschatology. Amen. Thank you. Very important scripture in Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Uh, my question to you, Brooke, because I know it's a question that people will be asking. Is this scripture specifically talking about, when it talks about the end, is it talking about the rapture or the second coming? It is talking about the rapture. How do we know that? Well, as you, you have listed there, Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, then the end will come. That gospel has to be proclaimed. Now, what's interesting, who's proclaiming that gospel? Well, if we look again, it's the angel doing that, maybe people, but it's not speaking about the 144,000, uh, uh, because in everyone's eschatology, that's uh, uh, after uh, the rapture, according to most. So anyway, it's speaking about the end of the church age. Very important that we, we see that. And then what happens? Well, this is put together with the abomination of desolation, what Paul speaks of in the scripture that we talked earlier in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then we see, beginning in verse 16, the emphasis is no longer on the disciples, but it's on the Jewish people, especially those in Israel. And what's going to happen there will be great persecution, great tribulation, not the great tribulation, doesn't say that. It says great tribulation. And there's a major difference between the phrase in the book of Revelation in chapter seven, where it says the great tribulation and what it says in Matthew 24, I believe in verse 21, where it says there will be great tribulation. Hmm. Two different terms speaking about two different times and two different subjects for those who are going through tribulation. Very important that we pay attention to all the biblical clues. So the end that's spoken of here is the end of the church age, which will be brought about by the rapture. Amen. Thank you. Final scripture we want to look at is in Isaiah 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. This, of course, we're looking at other scriptures as well, but 
the return of the Jewish people back to the land of Israel, uh, a, a key sign of the end days. I know that uh, since 1948, of course, there's, there's been such huge numbers returning back to Israel, which is amazing to see. And uh, for anyone watching that may not agree with me, I want to emphasize it is the land of Israel. It's the land of the Jewish people. It's no one else's. It's not the self-proclaimed Palestinians. It is the land of the Jewish people. So over to you, Baruch, for your comments on this scripture. Yeah, we're, we're seeing the scripture being fulfilled in our days. Yes. I was speaking at a, a conference uh, a little over a week ago, and I made mention. And I just thought it was just remarkable. There was a time, it was over a year ago, that the airport in Israel was closed. No flights going in, no flights coming out. But there were exceptions. And what were those exceptions? To bring new immigrants from different places to Israel. So even though the government shut down the airport, God says, I have a purpose. I'm bringing back my people. And there was the exception. So I saw that as just a strong testimony that the governments can do one thing, but if God wants to bring the people back to the land, he can uh, do it. And that's exactly what he's doing. And we see, as I mentioned earlier, that, that there are people. One of the things of the Ukrainian uh, conflict, that war, is that there's people who had no intention, Jewish people, of coming to Israel. They're coming to Israel now, and not just from their other places as well. Uh, this week, uh, Mikhail, who heads up our Russian and Ukrainian uh, ministry, he's arranged a conference. We're going to Minsk in Belarus, and, and there, there's a growing number of Jewish believers that want to come to Israel. And Michael, we work together, but his organization that, that he heads up is, is having a program to facilitate and assist those in Belarus and other places to come back to the land of Israel. So things are happening in our days. You have to be spiritually blind not to see these eight things converging together in order to tell the church we are approaching a wonderful event, our blessed hope. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, exciting times. Uh, I know that there's so much negativity going on in the world uh, around us every day. It seems like something else comes up that we never thought imaginable, but it, it's really amazing how Bible prophecy is fulfilling before our very eyes, uh, highlighting the, the perfection of Scripture and God's Word. Your final comments, bro. God's working. He's moving. We need to uh, open up our eyes and be informed by Scripture and, and study with one another. I, I really appreciated your statement about if we don't agree, we can still sit with, with one another and pour over these Scriptures in love, seeking truth, not seeking my opinion or your opinion, but, but seeking truth. And, and pray that the Holy Spirit, that he will be our teacher, that he will guide us, that he will open up my eyes, open up someone else's eyes to the truth that God wants his people to embrace and, and implement into their life. God does great things. And I can tell you, the more I seek him, the greater changes I have to make. So uh, we all need to study to show ourselves approved. God needs to make big changes in my life and in everyone's life. He's willing. Let's be submissive. Let's be humble and pour ourselves into the word of God. Amen. And, and just before we sign off, Baruch, I think that we, we do need some encouragement these days. Of course, encouragement comes from the word of God. Um, like you said, we have to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's counsel. We, like we said in the beginning of the video, we never set dates, but the Lord gave us signs. Uh, it's not going to come to us like a thief in the night. Um, people that quote that, they're, they're so wrong in quoting that. That's not for the church. We're not in darkness. Um, so whether it be three years, five years, 10 years, we don't know. But we don't think he's far away. What, what are your final comments brought to believers watching this video? How they can prepare? Because we see so many false teachings the Bethels of the world, like the seven mountain mandates and that everything's going to be perfect before Yeshua comes back, which is so false. What are your comments of encouragement and direction so people get prepared for the Lord's coming? 
be humble, be teachable, be seeking, be about uh, the Lord's work, be an executor of righteousness, get involved in things, don't uh, uh, sit on the sidelines, but, but be an influence to others and be a blessing to others. Ask God, God, show me how I can help someone, whether that's to pray for them, whether it's to bless them in some other way. There's so much that can be done in order to testify of our faith by, by deeds. Be people that are truly the, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We are equipped for that. Let's be doing the things that are pleasing to God that will be found as good and faithful servants because the days, they are short. Amen. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, we invite you to please subscribe, share, and like this video. As always, you can write to us at Australasia at loveisrael.org. Thank you so much, Brooke, for your time today. I really enjoyed today. Thank you, Christian. It, uh, it, it, it really just emphasizes and just encourages people that the Lord is not far away. Um, that doesn't mean that if you are watching this program, you don't know Yeshua, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't leave it. Don't leave it. Don't have that mentality. Well, it may be five, 10 years away. I'll live however I want to live and I'll, I'll do it later. None of us are guaranteed it tomorrow. Life is very, very delicate and fragile and precious. And uh, you certainly don't want to take that chance. Make Yeshua the Lord of your life today. Thank you, Baruch. And thank you to everyone watching. We pray you've been blessed. And we hope that you will join us for our next discussion video. Shalom and God bless you. Thank you.